Yeah. All right. yeah. Welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Gear. I'm, I'm trying to be like a little more like... chill. You know what I mean? A little more ah, relaxed. Like, can, can you don't like can that? Can you do it in a Canadian accent like a boot? Welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Gear, eh? Yeah, no, there, that yeah. wasn't good. That wasn't good. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Gear. Was that good enough, Skip? All of our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com. You can use our code THINK for some additional savings. High-quality third-party tested supplements from a company that you can trust. And we've got a new sponsor. Check out, and this is specifically for our Canadian people, supplementsource.ca. Um, they specifically uh, have products that are going to be that, that maybe they've got new labels, uh, products that there may be some type of like a closeout and you can get awesome savings on that. Plus you can get bulk savings too if you, if you purchase in like larger volumes, free shipping, all that. I'm gonna have a whole ad for all that stuff, but I wanted to mention it here. I also wanted to shout out all of our Patreon people. We had a bunch of new Patreon people. I'm gonna read their names off now. Ian, we've got Mike, Jack, Preston, Eugene, Danny, Lucas, and Vlad. Thank you guys. I appreciate having you guys at the Patreon. That's freaking awesome. You're helping us to put this thing together. Uh, oh, look at that. We've got Dan Kennedy with us. He said short dated because he's he's the CEO of supplementsource.ca and label oh. change. So do, do they ship to the United States too, or is it just Canadian? It's a Canadian thing. So, you know, we have true nutrition. They're awesome for us, but they don't do a lot of international shipping. So this is a great fit for us because we have a bunch of Canadian people who can't really do anything to support the channel. They can now by shopping at supplement source. Plus you can get some freaking crazy deals like we're talking you can get a tub of bcaas for like seven bucks or something so because you're in canada <laughs> yeah in yeah, yeah yeah there's that right yeah. let me add something too personally i think i'm speaking only for myself yes i if i don't know and a then we've got a topic company, i know if i don't know a <laughs> supplement company but i know the owners and i know that they have integrity and they have character and that they're honest people i will trust buying their products and i know Agreed. i did not know that it was dan and michelle yep there and you go they're great people and uh, you know i'm not telling everybody hey go throw out throw your money at them but yeah throw your money at them because they're good they're they're solid people so i i guarantee you that the products that they're selling are solid all right let's get into this thing we've got a bunch of listener questions today but first uh, nate has a topic and i thought this was a hell of a topic because it's something that's going around like wildfire right now in bodybuilding is uh, the the question is uh, the the current look we'll say of the Mister Olympia, uh, I, I you know I I'll say that I made a post talking about bodybuilding and how it's not dying and I got some backlash for it. I had people saying like, oh, bodybuilding's terrible now and that the guys look awful and all of this. Uh, I was just talking about how excited I was because bodybuilding is freaking awesome in my opinion. Uh, I'm seeing that, uh, as you said, Nate, there's old guys from previous generations of the sport that are saying they're looking at big Rami and they're saying that like, this is just atrocious and that this is not what we want in the sport. I wanted to get your guys' opinions and, uh, Nate, I don't believe you were there at the Olympia, correct? Right. But skip and Andrew, you guys were both at the Olympia and I haven't had a chance to talk to you since then. So, uh, spoiler alert, Big Rami won, in case anybody hadn't seen that yet. And uh, he is probably one of the biggest Mr. Olympias we've ever ha He is the biggest Mr. Olympia we've ever had, isn't he? Uh, I think Ronnie was two ninety. Oh, one year on Ronnie. I forgot. How but can I, I forget about Ronnie? I think you just Ronnie? blew it. You just blew it for anybody who was waiting for it to come out on Netflix. So, so <laughs> All right. Right. They're like, thanks a lot, Scott, you asshole. I was avoiding social media. Anyway. So what do you guys think about this? Anybody's welcome to jump in. Can I say something first? Yeah, it'd probably be a better. Anybody, we should anybody go but in, Andrew. In chronological well, order. Well, 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 <laughs> well, here's the thing. Okay. We all collectively need to get over the genetic talent pool that we had from the 90s. Okay. Like, <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm serious about that. Like, I just think that it was like that point in time where we just had so many good genetically gifted people that Crazy. happened to get into lifting weights and eating chicken and rice at the same time that they just, their proportions, their uh, symmetry, everything was just wacky. Okay, we need to just understand that that was like a point in time that will probably never be replicated again. It was hmm. like, you know, the Patriots, uh, you know, 2001 to 2006. And then again, from 2013, I just 
countered my own point. But well, from you know, you know what I'm saying though. Like when a team comes together and creates a dynasty, like, yeah, that just doesn't happen all the time, you know. So, and I think in our sport, like, and a lot of these older guys, and I think a lot of it just comes in a sense from jealousy because they didn't have the ability to have proportions and that size that these guys carry now. Now, personally. I like the guys in the nineties, their shape and structure a little bit better, but it, these guys that like to say that the conditioning is way worse today are dead wrong. Like, yeah. I, I, especially at the two twelve level, I, yeah. if you were there, what do you think? The, the condition was right on point, you know, um, you could pick up, pick on one guy here or there, but the top guys across the board were peeled. Yeah. But you bring up two twelve, and people will argue that two twelve isn't the open when <laughs> It's clearly, you know, it, I think we have to be careful. Like it's, number one, I'm going to agree with you that there is something to be said of that that era that may not be replicated. But I will say this. I do think from a genetic standpoint, you know, every gender, I'm older, so I mean, I, I, I feel this way and I felt like this way for a while. Not even just bodybuilding, but baseball and, and football. The next generation physically uh, typically outdoes the previous generation, whether it's, you know, methodology for training or nutrition or gear or just absolute fucking Perfect. genetics. The next generation is just going to be better. The Ken Griffey juniors and, you know, and that sort of thing. So I don't know that we won't see it, but you're safe with that prediction because it's going to be a while before we do see it. But my problem lies in the fact that it's comparing apples and oranges. And this is the 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 longstanding tradition of my generation was the best. It was the best when I did it because we have nostalgic connect. I have connections to the 80s and the 90s because it was a romantic time to bodybuild for me because I was younger. And I think that the older guys relate to that. They're also done. There does have to be a little bit. I like your word. It maybe maybe resentment. Not that jealousy isn't a good a good word because it is, but to, it's there's resentment. They can't do it anymore. And there's nothing worse than not being able to do it anymore and still see it continue to be done, not only as well, but potentially better. Do I like the current look? I don't, and I know this sounds really shit, but I'm in bodybuilding, so anybody, they can hold it against me if they want to. I've been in bodybuilding for a fucking long time. I wouldn't, I would take a hottie look if God came down and said, you must choose between the top three, you know, who you're going to look like for the next 20 years. I'm like, I'm fucking hottie. Yeah. I don't want that. I don't, I don't, it's not as appealing to me for the Rami look. Is it bad for the sport? It's open bodybuilding. If you don't like it, you have classic. If you don't like it, you have 212. If you don't like it, you have men's physique. There's so many options that at least back when it was just bodybuilding, you could hate on it. You'd be like, I don't fucking like this. They're too big. And there's nowhere else to go. But you have all these other divisions. So if you don't like one, follow the other. If you don't like that one, follow another one. If you don't like that, fucking follow bikini fuck. I don't know. It's that age old argument or debate about, you know, every generation arguing about who's better. I That's about the best way that I can wrap up my thoughts on it. Yeah, it was good. I didn't mean I didn't mean to leave anybody speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to leave the floor open for Nate. What's your thoughts, man? Uh, I mean, well, I think you know some of these older guys are saying that it's too extreme. But at the end of the day, I mean, bodybuilding is especially in the open class chasing that extreme. So it's like, is there really like a limit? I guess you know what I mean. <laughs> like that's just my opinion, and that's why like yeah. Skip was saying about the different classes, and that's sort of why yeah. that was created. But like they're not focusing on classic. So it's like, why don't you guys appreciate Seabum? You know what I mean? Like, and how great yeah. he is. Um, and then honestly, I mean, I will say like what, what Skip was saying is like, we're all going to have our personal preferences. And I think some of these older guys will pick apart certain, they're not going to focus on the good, I guess. You know what I mean? I guess that's right. so disappointing. Um, because there's numerous guys you could sort of go through the lineup and say they could compare well in the nineties. But I think it comes down to, like, what the judges are looking for. Like, I think Brandon Curry's coach actually made a really good post um, pretty much saying, like, okay, you know, Brandon won the Olympia. And they said, you know, what do you want? Like, the judges' feedback. Oh, we want you more condition. And then he came in the next year more condition mm. and then lost. And then they wanted him fuller and he came in fuller. And it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, we want conditioning and fullness. It's like, you know, when you get the judges' feedback and it's like, well, you got to be full and then you come back full. It's like, well, you got to be tighter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's really just yeah. that extreme balance. Um, and I think that back then 
especially the fullness wasn't quite as much of a factor. I mean, I think Andrew definitely touched on a point where these guys were genetic anomalies and like the lineups were pretty freaky. But I think now it's like guys are definitely there's a big game of fullness. And I think we saw that at Olympia, um, you know, because they weren't really rewarding necessarily like the most shredded guy. No, they didn't. Right. Biggest in fullness. Well, to be um, fair, Hottie did get third. I mean, did they give yeah. him the ultimate award? No, but right. That, that's a good I, point. I think if Hottie, if Hottie was three inches taller, he'd be Mr. Olympia for a while. I, I completely agree Hunter. with you. If he was Hunter's three inches perfect, tall, maybe even two, you know. I think Hunter's a perfect example because he came in full as a house. He was a little soft, in my opinion. I mean, you guys, I know he looked better in person, everyone said, but I still think he was like a little soft and a little watery, but he was huge compared to some I, I will say this about there. Hunter, like, because watching him on stage and then also looking at the screen that was on either yeah. side, very different picture. Like, yeah. Hunter had like cross striations on his lats and in his back and his quads. And I don't know why certain people, maybe it's their skin tone or just the tiny little sheen of water that they huh. hold in particular. But, and I'll agree that Hunter's never been like dry, dry, but he was right up. He was, he, I'll put it this way. He was as conditioned as Rami and as, and at least as conditioned as Brandon. Okay. Yeah. I would agree. And not only that, but we, I think we both agreed, Andrew, that he was harder when he first came out and he started to fade to the point where I laughed and said, somebody needs to get this motherfucker off the stage off. because yeah, because yeah. he looked good. So then it depends on when you saw the pictures that True. were taken, were they taken late? After they had posed three different rounds in three, you know, yeah. over the course yeah. of almost what 20, 20 minutes probably, yeah. or was it at the beginning? There's a lot. There's a lot of variables there. there well, too. then he also had a chance. He went and dried off, and then when he came back out for the final pose down. He looked nice and dry again. So yep, yeah. exactly, there was a lot and, of there was a lot of this. And so did Rami. Rami looked tighter exactly. when he came back out too. So well, yeah, exactly. like, God damn. Man. I'm, I'm the other point. Thing we should talk about yeah. the show is like you have your prejudging on Friday, right? Well, you do your, your initial appearance, your, your initial um, routine, and then for two hours you're sitting backstage before you go out and actually get compared to the other guys. And then the next night you come out and you do your routine at some point, and then the confirmation rounds an hour later, and then you come back. At, it, it, it seems like crazy, the setup, that you basically have to try to hold a peak for like not only a full 24 hours, but the peak peak for like four hours throughout the night. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the show wasn't just like, oh, open body bills going now. They're doing their individuals. They're doing their comparisons. And then we're going to we're going to. you know It does take away. That would take away four it hours is a long freaking time. Of, it's a lot of variables and things that can go wrong, especially if you're a guy that's blasting a lot of insulin to try to get that fullness and yeah. pushing the carbs and you're controlling your water and all these other variables. And uh, OK, don't wouldn't you guys agree that your initial pump up that you do is probably the best pump up you're going to get for the day? Yeah. Like when you try to go again, like an hour later to pump up again, very rarely <laughs> yeah. is it going to be as good as that first one, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Kind of like, like having sex, sex right? the first time versus. I was just, that's what I was saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Sex you know? the ninth time. But anyway, yeah. coming back, I want to touch on a point that Nate made because I think it's pretty good. The extreme part, I think, is important. The 90s guys think that that this generation is so extreme but if we went back to the 90s and we were in the 90s everybody thought those motherfuckers were the extreme it's a relative situation where they were extreme for that period of time so yeah. they took it further uh, uh, you know look i'll complain about the deaths and everything that's going on and that i do believe it is pretty fucking extreme but i'm okay with the extremes as long as people understand that they're likely not always, but they're likely to be trading days, weeks, and months the longer they take gear or the longer they abuse gear, then cool. That's my only concern is that people truly understand it instead of deny it. The extreme I'm cool with. There are people who want to be there. Are people who want to jump out of fucking planes. I don't want to do it. But if you want to jump out of a fucking plane, you go for it. I think that they almost kind of don't like that it's become more extreme. And the fan, the fan is funny because – Fans need to realize that the sport is not going to conform to them and what they want. The fan is along for the ride. The sport is the sport. Either come along for the ride or go find something else to follow. It's not going to conform to your, your selfish, narcissistic perspective of what you think the sport is going to be with your 17 followers and you, while you fucking troll everybody all day. Well, to add your point, though, the Olympia was pretty much sold out, right? Yeah. Oh, like yeah. When you look yeah. around, uh, my point is that people are 
people are going to see the freaks. They're going to see it's it's the nature of all sport. You want to you don't go to the Olympics to see some guy run the hundred meter five seconds slower than than you know the previous winner. You want to see someone break records. You want to see the home run guy, uh, the home run derby guy. You know who was it this year? Didn't he? Um, you know what I'm saying, but you want you want to see records broken. You want to see physiques right. pushed to the limits. And the point is, is that the fans are still showing up. So it's not a freakish sport to the point where the fans are dwindling. The sport is growing faster than ever. And I think the proofs in the pudding on Instagram, the proofs in the pudding at the big shows. That's all you got to look at. And yeah. the fans at the Olympia. I was this first one I've ever been to. I was only at the Arnold with Scott three three years ago. Those are the those are the only time I've been to the Arnold. Only time I've been to the Olympia. You know what I noticed when I walked in there? I'm standing in line waiting to get in with all these people. They're not big. They're yeah. not bodybuilders. They're yeah. fucking everyday people who you can tell they work out a little bit, but they're not meatheads. There's not like Nate Spears walking, people walking around. There's Quit not picking on me, Skip. Picking yeah. on me. <laughs> Andrew was there and clearly he stood out. But the point is, is a large majority of people really aren't. They, I expected no, more meatheads and and yeah. you know medium shirts with you know shoulders and well, wait a minute wait 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 wide lats yeah. and everything there was else. still plenty of that yeah yeah like the dudes I'll that tell were you wearing what, the there may have been but at I, 9 honestly, 30 at I'm night looking... okay Full on. Right, they, they, i think they put a spray tan on and yeah. you know I, rachel told me that she, she had to sit somewhere different she heard some one of these guys talking about their their uh their cycle that they were on just to come to the venue like oh yeah, i've been running 400 <laughs> trend uh to, you know for the for the expo it's like Oh Speaking for the <laughs> I think at the end of the day, you know what? Where did bodybuilding, where did all of this come from? This was a freak show. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we need to try to appease anybody. You know, I don't think that anybody who gets into competitive bodybuilding and wants to be as extreme as possible, that I don't think it's about trying to be pretty. I don't know. I don't know. I think yeah, that I for the people that truly love this thing, that it is about being extreme. It is about pushing it to that absolute limit. And that absolute limit is going to continue to evolve. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I can't remember somebody recently said something about like Arnold and imagine putting Arnold on stage with these guys like I mean, his conditioning. OK, he was he was in shape for what they did back then. But his his muscular, sure, his shape, his size, like it just he, he couldn't hang. So, you know, we could go off on a whole tangent about, you know, his his comments at the Arnold Classic. But I honestly I don't I don't think it's his place. And I don't think that this is I don't think it's the place of 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 any of the older generation to to have any kind of negative comments about what's happening. You know, they're, they're part of history and I love and respect that. And I love and respect where they're coming from, but they're not part of what's happening now. But Arnold's comments are a little bit more out of line because he has one of the biggest shows in the sport. It's disparaging. <laughs> it's, it's not cool to disparage the people, the competitors who are feeding your machine and yeah, have yeah, for yeah. so long. If it's just somebody that doesn't have, you know, if Kevin Leroni, you know, starts complaining or Flex Wheeler or someone, that's different. They don't really have this. Can I, I mean, you're going to you piss off enough people or piss off enough clients, clients, competitors, and they're yeah. not, they really might get to the point where they're like, fuck this asshole. I'm not competing in or, a show. Now that probably wouldn't or happen. Or sponsors. Sponsors. Yeah, it, sponsors, sponsors as well. Sponsors, at, like we saw at the Arnold. Redcon mm -hmm. one said we don't agree with you know the, some of the stuff that you're saying, so we're pulling our. And I think they were the biggest title sponsor too. So sure, yeah, yeah, so. it's cancel culture, absolutely. And sometimes it can be good, sometimes it's <laughs> annoying, but it all plays out. And you know that's you say things that other people don't like. Hey, talk about religion, talk about social things, and you're a trainer, and you're going to ostracize. You could ostracize a good half of your potential client base because you want to give your opinion. No problem with giving your opinion. Yeah. But just know that there might be ramifications to doing that too. Yeah. All right. Well, as much as I'd love to talk about this stuff all night, let's uh, let's dive into some questions, guys. Uh, if you want to take part in the next episode, you can ask questions in the YouTube feed. Feel free. Uh, we'll tackle those questions on the following show, um, which we are going to do right now. And uh, I didn't mention it yet, but if you guys aren't subscribed to our content, then subscribe. You'll love it. You'll learn all sorts of stuff about bodybuilding. You'll be entertained. And as I've said before, you can watch our programming instead of doing your job. There's that. All right. Let's see here. Um, 
we had a bunch of questions. Like I said, here's one from, uh, this is from our, our group. He says, thoughts on post-contest diet and how much weight should be gained across a one to four week period. I've been listening to a lot of Eric Helms and Eric Trexler talking about recovery, dieting, post-contest, and they say the goal should be 10 to 15% body weight increase four to six weeks post-show. I bring this up because uh, we are one week post-Olympia and Nick Walker just did a guest posing and said that he was over 20 pounds on Fuad's podcast, which puts him at about a 10% increase. Uh, I uh, one week and if he gained closer to 25 uh, what are your thoughts on this and what are your have your experiences been post contest with weight gain well you guys are pro I'll go, I'll go first because <laughs> yep. you guys will do a much better job than this but um, I was actually just talking to a client I was just explaining to him you know you could be up 10 pounds in a week because he was asking me the same question but if you look fantastic I'm not going to be too worried about it but if you're 10 pounds up in a week and you look at the water buffalo, then we need to make some adjustments. So, like, I know Andrew would definitely say this, but um, it's really just going off of, like, pictures and, like, how everything's going, how he's feeling, um, how he feels after the show as well. You know what I mean? Is he, you know, feeling great and ready to go? Um, is recovery still there? Because um, some guys are obviously going to be feel like a bag of dicks after the show. And there might be a fate where we might not really want to push food. You know what I mean? Um, so that comes into play as well. Um but, yeah, and so as far as Nick Walker, I mean, he's also a professional bodybuilder. He can do that and be fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he also really, competed yeah, for like a first. year straight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's actually fun, you know? Also, um, Ross points out that 20 pounds is definitely not 10%. Which I was. I thought the I, math was off a little bit. <laughs> I grabbed my calculator. Yeah. I was like, "Nah, that doesn't yeah. add up." Maybe if, it, yeah. if if he was a two hundred pound guy, but yeah. Yeah, but yeah I mean, my, me I think his I point though was he was up twenty pounds in six days, six yeah, or seven days. That yeah. was his point. The other guy, not for not the four to six weeks that the other yeah, Eric Helms had recommended. Right. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, I think Nate's hit it head on. Like everyone's individual. You know, everyone has their own. Um, um, tolerance, I guess, for how controlled they can be after a show. I tell especially women this because, mm. you know, before the show, you have that very strong motivator of getting on stage in a little thong, basically, and showing your body off. So you're going to do everything you can. You know, you're going to follow your plan. You're going to look your best. Post show, there's not that major <laughs> fear motivator anymore, you know? So it's really just comes down to how strong your will is. Um, you know, how do you want to look, you know, at that point, how, and like Nate said, how's your body feeling? How's your recovery? How's your sleep? You know, there are some cases where you need to push food a little harder. There's some cases where you have to be really extreme with people and take it step by step. I find in particular women that you've really had to push to get in shape. You have to really peel the onion back very, very slowly. You can't just let's, you know, throw 20% calories back at you. Agreed. It's more like let's make, yeah, let's make 10 to 15 grams of carbs increase, you know, a day for a week. And let's see how you do with that, that kind of thing, while also pulling cardio and, and stims. So it's so individual. I, I hate when people give like these uh, 10 to 15 percent or a weight number or anything like that. I think if you're a good coach, you're working with your client, you're looking at, you know, um, you know, their pictures, you're talking to them, their blood work, all that kind of stuff and taking that into account. So and everyone's different. You know, someone can put on 25 pounds in like two weeks and still look sick. Whereas someone else can put on 20 pounds and they look like they, they barely started their diet, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I don't, there's not much I can disagree with there because again, it's individual. I know that doesn't, you know, the, the guy asking the question is kind of like, Oh, I wanted more of a specific. <laughs> and I get that. I understand that. But uh, I would even like to think that the two Eric's, are giving those black and white numbers as more of a parameter. Uh, I'm sure they understand too that it's individualistic. So I don't want them to think or someone else to think that we're bashing them because I just don't like numbers. I don't like formulas for caloric intake. I don't like numbers until it comes to a scale weight. And even when it comes to scale weight, and this pertains, this has to do with the original question too here that we're addressing. And that is, the scale weight matters, but in a situation coming off post show, I want to see everything else first. I want everything from your hunger to your strength to how you're feeling, how you're sleeping. But visually, of course, that's the most important thing. And then I want to look at the scale weight and, and then put that all together. And I think we all do the same thing. It's not one thing. It's a, it's a bunch of shit fitting together 
perfectly to, to, to find out which variables are more important than the others. If you're carrying 20 pounds and it's, it looks like it's all sub Q water and your face is puffy and you can't get your ring off or your shoes laced or you take your shoes off at night and it looks like you got ankles and shit like that. That's different than being full and dry and hard as shit and you're up 20 pounds. So that is where those individual things come into play. Justin, I want to make this point. Justin Harris had a client who just came off a show about eight to 10 weeks ago. I don't know if you guys have seen this or not, but I've actually, I was secretly a little bit concerned when his weight was going, going up so much in about eight weeks. I think he had gone up 50 or 55 pounds. Holy when shit. I, heard that, I, was, I know. But then I looked at him. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like he's still good. So this is the ext- he did. I mean, to the point where I'm thinking to myself, God damn, maybe you didn't have to go down that far to begin with, you know, to or to to be where he was. Now, that's not me questioning Justin as a prep guy. I'm questioning just looking at the numbers and everything else and how good he looked post show and that he was clearly, you know, shredded and everything else. But when you make a rebound like that, you're probably pretty fucking depleted too. So how depleted are you coming off the show? Yeah. Or did you go into the show relatively, you know, your recovery was decent. You were able to back off at the end. Everything went right versus chasing the 11th hour and you're just beat to shit and you're depleted as hell. And you got just full enough for the show, but then you continue to fill out for the next week, 10 days before you start to spill. There's a lot of variables there. I think the visual matters more than, more than anything. And you gotta be careful coming off the show. These rebounds can be, I don't want to say dangerous, but they can be unhealthy in the sense that if you're not careful with the amount of weight you're getting back, the stress that comes to the body post-show, heart, kidneys, everything, blood pressure, all that shit, it really is a, it needs more attention than it gets. Yeah. I got something that maybe he would be interested in. What Maybe we talk about, you know, because like we, we, we all probably tell people, you know, after the show, go have a good couple meals on the Sunday after the show, eat what you want that day, et cetera. What do you guys do? Um, you know, do you have an initial plan for like that Monday after the show, you know, in preparation for their off season starting? So, you know, they had some fun for a day or two, maybe they're up 12, 13 pounds, it's water, but do you have a plan in place for them so that that water doesn't turn into something worse? It's, you know, you can get them dry again and then start with a clean slate. That, that's what I'm asking. Mm-hmm. And he might, I don't have anything this. written. I don't do a plan as far as this is what I want you to do. I want everything r- structured and rigid by Monday. I have a few things I could throw at you real quick. Number one, hydration has to be, you have to focus on fluid intake more than you focus on fluid. You can eat what you want for a few days. Let's say two, three days, but it's portion control. You can't sit down and eat it like the chocolate cake and Matilda. You have to actually, and if you have kids, I just saw that scene the other day. day. Yeah, it's it was on the TV, good. and I just sat down. And I'm like, oh, what is this? And, and with the kids <laughs> eating the trip. cake, and he finishes it. Yeah, I just saw oh, that. Yeah. That's crazy. You brought that up. <laughs> so you got it. You have to have portion control, but you can pretty much eat what you want within reason, as long as you're hydrated, you're pushing water, and again, it's portion control. I don't want anybody training for at least the first half. If you are, I got to be in the gym. I got to be in the gym. I'm still going to push your ass adamantly tell you to not be in the gym till at least Wednesday. And when you do go back in, fuck around, have a pump, talk to your friends, pose in the fucking mirror, show off how retardedly full and vascular you are and have fun with it. Don't come back. I, it's such a vulnerable period. And I keep saying this because it's so important. People get shingles myself. People get horrible bronchitis. Your immune system. Most times, if you have pushed it to that edge or even gone slightly over your immune system is in the toilet. And it's funny because the immune system's weird. You won't get all that shit while you're in the stressful period. You get it Mm -hmm. when the body reverts and the stress dies down. And then all of a sudden you've got this shit, chaotic, unhealthy mess unfolding inside your body. But you, Scott, with your guys. Uh, You know what? I was just waiting to move on to the next question. (laughs) (laughs) Never mind. I thought this guy would get something out of it, but I will say like when dieting someone down, it's like if someone's doing two hours of cardio and I have them on no carbs and I know like coming out of that, they're probably going to like, if I have someone going into a prep, I know like their body at well at that point, like I know someone's going to be able to handle food and push them right out the gate. Like for me, I can handle a good amount of food like coming right out of prep so we like last time we slammed food pretty pretty fast and i responded really well you know what i mean whereas someone else you know what i mean you might have to like inch their way back you know yeah. like andrew was saying so i think that's definitely you know what i mean it's person to person i definitely get what he was saying about the numbers because sometimes people ask you a question and they really want a number 
you yeah. know what I mean? So it's you sort of give them something because they don't want anything else. Like they don't want this answer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I saw too. A couple people did chime in saying about those, those numbers that were put out initially from Helms, uh, Helms gathers clinical data uh, to help formulate algorithms and statistics for nutrition. And uh, basically he's saying that it's, it's just one here, here's, tool. Here's the thing though. There's not clinical data on bodybuilders using mass dosages of T3, mm. Clen, Tren, all sorts yeah. of things that modulate your metabolism. Like maybe they're doing it with general population people, but I'd love to see a study where they took high level bodybuilders and, and, and did what he's talking about. So I don't. I just yeah. don't think the the math adds up that way. Yeah, you know I can appreciate I mean? the effort that they're trying to put the science behind it. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. there's so many variables that are not. It was like when we were talking about that study about growth and everything, you know, growing and optimal yeah. growing. And I'm like, there's all these variables. How could you possibly? But I do appreciate their efforts of trying to yeah. put science behind it. Don't get me wrong. But, but you get what I'm saying. It's so hard to like oh, yeah. track bodybuild, like especially when like. Do bodybuilders report everything that they're doing or the doses yeah. that they're taking? So, right. you know. Right. I do like your idea, Skip, of telling people to just chill. And and I do like the idea of if that they have to go to the gym to tell them to just hang out and pose with their friends. Because that's half the time. Like when I have a guy that does say like, oh, man, no, Sunday I want to go to the gym after the show. I'm not worried about them squatting a ton of weight. I know that they're going there so that they can like, show their you know pictures you're to their the friends strength machine yeah and you're doing the curls and so that you can go yeah. and hit some most musculars and yeah like, mm -hmm. i think that's how the training should be for the whole week yeah week. yeah i like that a lot um all right so here's something else like i said i'm I, I was just hanging in the background here trying to look at new questions that we could pull up as i as i look at dj you know getting ready to tune the new uh song in as the old one's ending no, um, the maestro <laughs> so when Darren asks, when classic move to 212 or 212 to open, is it all diet or do they up the gear as well? Well, well first, I'm going to say that most people, they're not like, they're not putting the governor on like the majority of people. <laughs> That's the true. majority of people are not right. like purposely putting governors on anything, whether it's food, gear, yeah. training. So the body grows as fast as it grows. We all have different genetic limitations with that, with how our body responds to all the stimuli. But I can think of one case in particular where, like, in, uh, like our classic physique champion, Chris Bumstead. You know, I think he's been pretty open with documenting his diet and um, his gear usage, which is fairly minimal, especially you know, even on a, well, it'd be low compared to like an entry level NPC bodybuilder, if you ask me um, today. And then as far as calories, for him to make that weight cut off. I believe I saw somewhere like 1,600 calories or something like that, which is pretty yeah. low for a 240-pound guy, you know, yeah. um, to be able to operate, do your training, do your cardio, and, and whatever other things he has to do during the day. So for him to move to open, I think, yeah, he would pull the governor off, and he would start eating more, and he would start taking more. And I don't think his training would need to tra uh, uh, change at all because – I was watching one of his videos today and he was like four weeks out or three weeks out deadlifting six plates for like 10 reps. So mm -hmm. I don't think he's holding himself back when it comes to training at all. I just think, you know, he's one of those rare situations where he looks awesome as Mr. Classic Olympia. And I think that's where he, he's going to want to stay. And we can also make the argument that it's a better decision for him because it's safer long-term. You know? Yeah. While other guys might be chipping hours off their life, he might be chipping seconds or minutes off, you know, just to put right. it you know what I mean? Well, I so, yeah, that's my take on it. The biggest, biggest change would be food. I mean, because honestly, besides obviously Chris, I think most guys are probably doing the same thing that I'm doing. They're just probably not eating as much food. And I feel like most of those guys probably are training hard too. You know what I mean? Just because let's say at the national level, you know what I mean? From classic uh, to maybe middleweight or whatever, um, they just might not be pushing the food as much as me. And I think that's what really creates the the big How growth. You know down? Um, in my opinion, but because I honestly, I think most guys are pretty much on the same, same length as far as what the gear use is. I don't think I'm on anything crazy uh, as a national super heavyweight, you know what I mean? And honestly, I see some of these guys train, like he was saying, Chris trains like an animal, you know? Um, but you know, when you have to stay within a weight limit, you know, I'm sure in their off season, they're not like, okay, I got to hit 280, right? <laughs> if they got to hit, if they got to make 210. 
right? Because they're going to be yeah. um, cautious of that. So, you know, while they're in their off season, they're like, oh, shit, I'm at 250. I better, you know, bring some food back or whatever. Yeah, true. I have to wonder a couple things. Uh, one with gear, I would bet that a lot of the classic guys avoid compounds that are known I say known that are that they know to be whether it be true or not to be negative as far as holding more water and being more puffy and more bloated. I don't know the classic guys are going to be doing a lot of anadrol and heavy type. I think they tend to keep with the more mild. I don't. I'd almost call them classic compounds. The other <laughs> thing is the food. I think is important. And I'll tell you why. I think that their volume of I, the calories are important, but I think the volume of food matters because you're not going to be able to pull a massive, huge vacuum like that. If you're eating routinely eating large, large amounts of food and large meals. Uh, so I would imagine that, uh, especially in Bumstead's case, as an example, I don't think he's going to be putting down day long skip loads or forcing mm -hmm. large amounts of food you know, to, he's got to keep so much of that control of his midsection yeah. that that's another way that he would not want to push growth. And this comes back to the midsection problem. I said, I said that I, and I still stand by this, that the midsection problem in open body, but it started in the nineties of so force feeding for size, but I'll leave that alone. I just want to make that point. I won't go out on it any further than that. Um, and I also think that the classic guys are going to probably stay away from the things that they think. Uh, and again, whether it is or not, it doesn't, it's not a debate for, you know, I want to create a debate now, but the insulin, high dose GH, things like that. It's that is not going to be as out of control in the classic divisions where they have to keep control and they don't even want to risk the fact of whether it's true or not. I'm just going to try to stay away from it. I got to keep my my waist tight. Uh, as far as training, I completely agree with you guys. I liked your governor reference because a lot of these classic guys are in classic because their structure is classic and they're getting as big as they can. I think the people who are putting governors on are the people who are borderline can go to the next class, but they're staying in whether it be classic or 212 because they can be more dominant there than to jump into the big pool and wonder how they're going to do. Because remember business, uh, your exposure, your PR, your status in the industry and in social media feeds your business, which feeds your revenue stream. So there are people who are going to make those decisions, not personally what division they're going to compete in, but because of business. Yeah. I think one more thing, though, we're really only talking about like top pros here that are on the cusp, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a NPC guy and you're in classic and you can, and you have the ability to keep growing, you're going to keep growing. Sure. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. I mean, so we're really only talking about a few people here that are really at that at that stage, you know? Yeah. Yep. All right. Agreed. I got one for you, Skip, because I feel like I've heard you talk about this stuff before. I feel like this is like the kind of question we used to get every episode of blood sweat and gear episode one <laughs> through episode 50 <laughs> it just reminds me of an old school question uh do you guys think that a pro qualifying level uh, that on the pro qualifier level using hgh pre-contest is an absolute must or is it overrated for example uh, if you had two thousand to five thousand dollar budget to spend on gear pre contest, would you rather spend it entirely on androgens? That'd be a lot of freaking gear, uh, anabolics and AI, uh, or portion portion some of that budget towards pharma GH. And this is from one of our Patreon guys, so shout out to you, Ian. Well, it says, would you? Oh shit! Give me that again. Because oh. I just want to make sure it's semantics. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, just, just listen I think to if me. You're, okay. I think okay, if you're a no, white guy oh, and you're at the national level, you should definitely have a little bit of money set aside for GH. Yeah, that's for sure. But but he said is, and this is what I wanted to make sure of his wording is an whether I think it's an absolute must or is it overrated. I don't think it's an absolute must. Um, do you think it's overrated? If you're, well, no. To is GH pre contest an absolute must? I don't think it's an absolute must. But again, if you're going see the thing with bodybuilding is. You want to make sure that everything you're doing is a hundred percent in as far as your plan and, and the way that you're putting things so that you're good with when you get the results, you're good that you didn't leave a stone unturned. So 
if it were me, I would most definitely want to use GH for a prep. I would not want to leave it out. But if I didn't have the money and I could still do the prep, but I couldn't afford the GH, would I still do the prep? I might still do it. I don't know that it's an absolute necessity, but I would probably at the end, if I took second, would be like, oh, damn, if only I would have taken the growth. Maybe I would have won. That's leaving a stone unturned. So it's... I, to say, is it an absolute month for me? I would want it in there and I would have the money to be able to have everything right from there. You're, you know, you're making exceptions. If you, if you, you know, you're, you're making uh, concessions, I guess is a, is a better word. You're, you're kind of cutting corners. Uh, and the question is, does he think it is, is he going to feel like he's leaving something out? Because if you do, I know you're trying to be quiet. It's my wife over there. She's pulling a Rachel right now. <laughs> <laughs> you just you just told Rachel. Can you turn that down? So I'm trying to be quiet. I'm trying to be quiet with a grocery bag. Quit, quit talking shit about her, Skip. <laughs> <laughs> she can't hear you because I have headphones on. Oh shit. <laughs> I I would say that I would agree, with Skip. It's not an absolute must, but I would also say it's not overrated. So yeah, because his yeah. second question was, is it overrated? And it's like, yeah, no, that's true. You know, it's like, you know, shoot a, even a, a moderate level of GH. And I think you're going to notice a very big difference in fullness, recovery, sleep um, daily. Is it a strength thing? No, but I just think it does have a cosmetic effect that is that you don't get when you're not using it. And I'll just leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Well, you got anything, I'll, Nate? I'll, play double I'll say, do I think I could place second or third at nationals? <laughs> Without it still? Yes. Am I going to test that theory? <laughs> no. <laughs> very, very well put. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, right. well, I mean, it, it comes down to finances, right? I mean, first yeah. off, my finances wouldn't dictate whether I'm doing a show one way or the other. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it would. But if, if, if I'm already setting aside a $2,500 gear budget, like that wouldn't like not having GH would not be the me like, oh, I can't do bodybuilding anymore. I can't compete anymore. Right. It'd be like, yeah. I guess I'll see the best I can do. But if yeah. he can find a way to squeak out a couple kits of GH, I would absolutely do that. That would yeah. be my advice. But you wouldn't spend that budget. You wouldn't focus your Like if you only had 2,500, you wouldn't be like, okay, I'll get all the GH I can. Yeah. I'll use a few bucks here for anabolics. You're going to put your, no. you're going to focus on the anabolics first. And then you're going to be like, I need to rob yeah. a 7 Eleven. Well, I, <laughs> I don't I know because be I respond better to the, like the peptides. Me and, me and Scott Stevenson have had some good talks about this. I'm yeah. a peptide guy, meaning GH okay. and insulin. And not so, and I, and I don't respond very well to your typical, you know, um, you know, your testosterone and all that kind of stuff. I, I respond better to your DHTs and your and, and your peptide compounds. So I I would find a way to get it in there. <laughs> I would definitely find a way. Yeah. Like Skip said, Rava 7-Eleven. That's all you got to do. Yeah, I'll do that. I'm not above begging. <laughs> all right. Uh, we got time for a couple more here. I'm going to start L-Carnitine from our sponsor, Amino Asylum. Use code THINK. Any ideas on dose and protocol? I'm going to tell you guys right now, by the way, I've gotten some good stuff from this. And since we've been talking about it, a few of the guys that I've been working with, I haven't I haven't pushed the idea of L-carnitine in the past. I've heard so much good stuff. Scott Stevenson talked about it. Victoria talks about it. John Meadows had talked about it at a seminar down in the Arnold. Um, and I never could get behind it because I didn't like the idea of painful injections of three cc's every day. And the new stuff that I've seen from the sponsor has been nearly pain free at mar- far less, far less. And I, I would say that I'm officially sold now. And I'm excited too to hear your guys' thoughts and experiences on this one. For prep or off season? It doesn't say. Do let's say let's say for okay. dieting. If it's prep, I'd go with it. But I don't like that for, for the same I quit using it for the same reasons that you said. I got tired of the, and I'm like, I'm injecting enough other shit that mm-hmm. I am tired of this. And I couldn't see an obvious, I couldn't look at the end and go, yeah, this made a dramatic impact. It was something that, yeah, we're in, I don't know if you remember this or not. We talked about this, but it's been a while ago. I still am not convinced 
because I was using both insulin and carnitine. I was not convinced that leaving, and I understand it's like four, still five or six years ago, okay? I was still in Colorado, but I was not convinced that the insulin wasn't doing it itself yeah. and the carnitine not playing into it. So, or, or the carnitine not being the deciding factor because I had used carnit or uh, insulin pre-workout in low dosage uh, before I ever knew that apparently aceto did, did you know something similar, and I really liked it, but I didn't want to say anything because I thought I'd be ripped to shreds, and that it was such a fucking horrible idea. Like, oh my god, what are you doing? You're doing, and it countered that idea of I had always. And if you go back to intense muscle years and years and years ago, I would repeat the mantra that you know anytime insulin is in, I'm trying to, it's I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically the same thing. When insulin levels are high, it's like you put a lock on body fat as, as far as accessing body fat. But it's not that simple. And I oversimplified it. So I was battling with that in my head going, this can't be, I can't be benefiting from this because I'm increasing my insulin level to obviously lower blood glucose and make the, the process more efficient. But I couldn't wrap my brain to, around it to understand. It, so I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to get you know, beat, beat up for it or someone that's getting it or say, explain it. I don't know. I can't fucking explain it. I don't know why I think it works. So I'll go back to it. If the, if the injections aren't very painful, I would give it a shot. Uh, but uh, I don't, I did not like it and I didn't like the frequency of it and I didn't see that it was all that big, but then I hear people talking and raving about it. So I'm like, damn, it didn't hurt. I tried to get it. So Pre, getting back to what I was going to say, Skip, uh, pre-contest, I think it's good to use, and it's especially the same way you were talking about, taking it pre-workout with a little bit of insulin, some intracarbs, et cetera. Um, I think 500 milligrams to 600 milligrams is, is a good dose. Now, I think that's a good idea if you're running T3, uh, a good amount of T3. And here's why. Because we've now learned that um, high doses of carnitine can – uh, negate some of the effects of the thyroid action on um, in, on the cells. Um, Scott Stevenson had done has done a couple articles on this, and he's done a couple talks about it as well. I've had conversations with him about it, and and we we've come to the conclusion that that's why I'm able to get away, or, or why I need to use higher dosages of T3 in my preps because I also use a lot of the carnitine. Now off season when you're not using um, uh, T3, I think you should limit it to like two or three days a week. So you're getting the benefit of added um, additional carnitine loaded into the cell, uh, increase in uh, fat utilization for the Krebs cycle, et cetera. Um, but uh, where else was I going to go with that? Yeah. So I think, you know, I absolutely think it's good in the, in the um, pre-contest phase used uh, daily with insulin uh, in particular and a um, little bit more intermittently in the off season. Okay, do you do it though because it makes sense and is sensical on paper, or or have you truly like? Can you tell the difference? Oh no, 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 no. Skip. I can. Okay, like, and the I first, figured because I can't the imagine month you doing I it without it. seeing it. First okay. month I All used right. it, I felt like my body was an incinerator and I was fuller and rounder, like right off the okay. bat. Okay. So right. yeah, absolutely, right. yeah. Sold me. <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> We've never had to use it with you. You lose fat no, as no. it is. <laughs> I found that. At 400 milligrams pre-workout without insulin, but I eat carbs though leading into that. So, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm sure there's some insulin in there. I've gotten better endurance because I'm still dealing with like a lot of lag, you know, and a lot of brain fog still from post COVID. And I found that those things are better. Like I have better endurance through my workout. I get hotter. Like I sweat a yep. lot more yep. using it. And then, like I said, overall endurance is better. And then through the day, my brain fog that I get is a lot clearer. Like I, I can function, but it's like, I, I'm like, yeah, I'm me like a hundred percent. I can tell on the days I take it. So I'm a big fan. I've had people getting experiences like it's early still. So it's hard for me to say on fat loss, but like one guy that I work with is a natural MMA fighter. And he added that in he'll, he'll train, and then he'll go to do MMA and he'll take it pre-training. And he's noticed a difference with his endurance and his sweating, like through MMA, he's had a much better experience with it. So I'm a fan. And that's, that's so far we've been going lower dose, like 400 milligrams. And I'm seeing something with that. I know they make a 600 milligram per milliliter. I didn't want to, I was afraid it was going to be painful though. So I went with the 400 cause I figured it wouldn't hurt as bad, but it was pain free. So I'm going to try the 600 next time around. So when we talk about the painful stuff, that was um, the Synthetech, Synthetine product. That stuff was painful. Yeah. Did you, is that what you used, Skip? 
Uh, you know, it's been so long that I don't remember. I want to say it was from Synthetech. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I want to say yeah, it that was. That shit burned. Yeah. And it was only 200 MIGs per, so you had to take like two or three cc's of it. Yeah. To exactly. A exactly. Dose. So I don't know yeah. how Amino Asylum is making it, that they're able to fit more of the active, you know, carnitine yeah. with less fluid. Like, I'd be... Yeah. I, sometimes I wonder, I'm a little skeptical because I've seen them and Amino Pure, another company that, that, that do the high dose stuff. And I'm like, this barely, it just feels like water. And I know what the other stuff used to feel like because my leg would be, I put it on the side of my thigh and be like numb, you know, for most of the training session. And so I don't know, like, I'd just be interested to see, maybe they, they want to tell us about how they manufacture it differently. That'd be interesting. That'd be interesting to hear. Um, all right. We got time for maybe one more question here. So I'm looking for. A good one actually where was this at give me just a second here guys uh, we'll call this an intermission and I can just cut it on the final podcast now let's talk a little bit about TRT and cruising okay. um, TRT cruising or just simple cruising Simply cruising. So does he mean, okay, let me just read the rest of this. Is it good, bad, or neither for maximum results overall? Uh, what about health, especially for people on TRT who will never come off? So is he talking about like cruising, like a bro cruise, I'm assuming, versus a, a true TRT? I think that's what he means. Or or was he saying, was, did he mean to say TRT cruising versus just simply coming oh, off? And maybe that's like what he means. Damn. I feel like we get that question sometimes. Yeah, that could be it. What do you guys think? I like the I like to cruise with with gear. I, I don't. Um, if you're in this for you know what I call the long haul, I guess I want to try to maintain more stable blood levels. Like I don't ever want my testosterone to dip to like you know thirty for a, a, even if it's just for a few weeks while the HPTA is is kicking back on. So for yeah. me, you know. And, and and for me, my TRT dose is actually very low. I've, I I always plan my cruises to be like 250 megs of test, and then I forget to take at least one dose a week, and it ends up being like 125, and I feel fucking fine. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure all you guys probably agree. Like, you know, when you're already in bed at the end of the night, and you're like, oh, I forgot to take my TRT dose. I'll take it tomorrow. And then tomorrow you do the same thing. You're like, ah, fuck it. I'll just take it next Monday. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, we, we, when you're prepping and stuff, you're taking things sometimes every day or every other day. So, you know, your cruise periods, you're like, eh, whatever. Like, so so I, I miss a dose, big deal. But in terms of, um, so PC teen, I don't really like doing, unless someone's just adamant about, look, you know, I only want to do one or two short cycles a year and I want a PCT after that and be natural, then I will do a PCT with them. I just do think there's no way to completely negate the effects of that dip in testosterone and androgens that you're going to get when you pull um, exogenous testosterone out. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as long as I, don't okay I have with anything that. to add there. I don't have anything to add to it. Quite frankly, I completely agree. I don't want my test levels bottoming out too. And I'm not a big fan of PCT and I don't necessarily talk clients out of it. But I will tell them the pros and the cons, and I will, and I do remind them, it isn't necessary unless you know that it's necessary. So if you're only going to, I tell this clients all the time, don't ever take a drug because you naturally assume you have to to counter another drug. You need to find out if you it's not like you you run Deca or something, and you have to. Oh, I got to take Caber with it. You do. You should figure out whether you need it or not because adding it without knowing. It could be just you're taking one more fucking thing that you don't know that you need. And I think that I feel that it's the same way with PCT. I think that's, it's very important. That's a very uh, uncommon belief or idea in bodybuilding, I think, with PCT. Because uh, I think that when I came up, you know, that the whole idea on the message boards was that you just take it. You know, like yeah. the, the the first question, you know, if you're like, hey, guys, this is my cycle. What do you think? And they'd be like, well, what's your PCT? You know, that was always the first yeah, question. Right. <laughs> so I feel like a lot of us were programmed to just do it. And I still I still am of the belief that, you know, Clomid is going to help, you know, quickly. You're going to like this. You know, I, 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 I grew this muscle with enhancements because I wanted to do it quickly with with, you know, bodybuilding drugs. So I also want to recover quickly. And why am I going to go all natural about it now uh, versus, you know, just just do that. But, you know, 
uh, we've had on Dr. Dean St. Mart from uh, Ireland, very intelligent guy. And he has, he would agree with you, Skip. He said that you should give it a long period of time, basically not only let the ester clear, but then additional time. I can't remember how much time you said, and then check your blood levels and then make your decision on what you're going to do off of that. That makes sense to me. You know, I mean, you, you can't argue that. But I still, though, like, because I really thought about it when he when he presented that, because, you know, he's, he's a doctor, smart dude and all this. And he spent a lot of time, like, talking about PCT from, you know, a, a, like a medical point of view. At the same time, I was like, I still questioned it. And I still came to that conclusion that for me personally, I did this you know, not naturally. And I'm going to also try to recover as optimally as I can too. Right. So we I disagree gotta... on few things, but that's where one of them where we disagree. Mm -hmm. well, would, would you, Scott, would you rather um, avoid the PCT and the coming off and just doing like more of a blast and cruise or even like a extent, like most of your, like for me, like most of my years cruising and then contest prep time, it's time to add the goodies in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, like, I do. I think that like, you know, it's, it's such a crappy situation for the younger guys that want to recover and maybe they want to remain fertile and they don't want to take that step, you know, but I could definitely say that the results aren't the same for them. The guys who do completely come off, you know, I also want to point out the thing about the fertility and using drugs for a long period of time. I, we always used to think like, oh, if you take steroids, you're basically committing yourself to never being fertile and never being able to have kids. We have just seen that over and over again not be the case. We've seen guys loaded up to the nines. Boom! On, Thank you for saying that. <laughs> on, yeah, on contest prep shit, like, you know, they're like pros mm -hmm. that somehow they're like two weeks after or three weeks after their show, they're like, got some great news here. Me and the wife are having a baby. And you're like, doing the math, you're like, motherfucker, you were running probably like 2,000 megs of gear during that time. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, that's a, the big thing. I think the younger guys, I, I, I get asked a lot. And, you know, there's plenty of act of uh, videos on YouTube of, of people going in and talking to a PCT doctor and going through the steps. And, you know, I, I've actually had a client right now who um, recently just was able to get his wife pregnant after, you know, staying on some low TRT and um, adding just a few uh, compounds in for a short while. And it was no problem whatsoever. And he'd been gearing for years. So I've I, seen I, it. I, I think. I've yeah, seen I think it. it's a, it's, a, it's a myth that we we just think oh you're shutting down your HPTA forever and you're going to lose all your sperm your sperm motility now not to say it's not going to be maybe more of a challenge and you're going to have to do a little bit of testing and working with you know some some experts on it but it doesn't like preclude you from being able to do the things that you might want to do after bodybuilding. Yeah, I, more importantly too, the few let's say it decreases sperm count, the ones that are left they have like <laughs> S's on their chest. They're strong. They can. They can swim like motherfuckers, man, because I was on for three, and, and I know I'm going to get blasted for this, but three yeah. and a half years when our last daughter was conceived. So I looked at my wife. I'm like, bitch, I don't know who you're sleeping with. Now. No way. I'm fucking like, there's no way that came from me. And then she came out. She kind of looked like me. So I thought, oh, I think I'm good. It happens. And, and it's funny because that's what got me looking into it more because I thought, okay, you know, am I the only one? And I've heard other stories. And so I started looking into it more and though it can impact, you know, sperm motil mot oh, yeah. motility, motility, is that the word I'm looking motility. for? Motility. Yeah. Motility. Okay. So there gotta and, be a and, number and then they also gotta be able to swim the right way. Right. They gotta be strong and not like have three tails. Yeah. Or they can't just go like, like in that. circles. Right. Yeah, exactly. Lick, you know, lick the window. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so I looked into it more and I found that there were a lot of people I was having client after client after client. They're like, okay, I got to get off. You know, my wife wants to have a baby or anything. They're not off two weeks in the fucking cheap fucking wife is pregnant like dude you didn't just get her pregnant she's been fucking pregnant for a month month and a half and it kept happening kept happening so this is after years and years and yeah i'm like there ain't no the only connection i still stand by this is when people are when guys are on gear they have more girls i don't know what the fuck it is <laughs> but you they said have more girls. to that I, I, I actually tried to look into the research about that. There's nothing in the research. I don't it, see anything. Either. Just all the guys <laughs> that we know yeah. have a right. high proportion of female do yes, of, they of do. daughters. I what I was going to say, though, is I, I was going to add that uh, I think that if I were to go back and do it again, when I did go to a cruise phase, I would take it down lower than I had. I yeah. think that. I think a lot of guys are not coming off now. And I think that these cruise periods, that, that the doses are getting higher and that we're seeing 
more than ever now, like I think like IP6 is probably one of the most popular <laughs> supplements because people are trying to figure out how to lower their hematocrit. And why is their hematocrit high? Because they're never reducing the dose. We have, you know, it's not like that they're getting older and now they just need to be careful with how they run shit. It's like 22 <laughs> year old kids, 25 year old kids that are, you know, running 400, 500 milligrams as their cruise dose. Yeah, and right, I think right. that there is a value to like really bringing it back, really dialing it back. So I would do that differently because you know what? To me, TRT was like 350, 400 milligrams at one point, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, high. if you misunderstand the definition of TRT, yeah, you're to blame for not. <laughs> yeah, or 450 or 400 yeah. or whatever. You like how I did that? I was like 350 yeah. or 400. <laughs> and it doesn't go up right away. It creeps. It starts at 200, then it goes, oh, I got sip. I got 250 sip. I'm just going to do a milligram. Yeah. Like, what's the difference between three? Now I got an anthate, so I'm going to run it, you know, just shit like that. And it yeah. creeps up. It doesn't just go to 400. It's I'm glad you caught that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I actually, I had one more here. I know I said that was the last one. And uh, Skip, I know you were excited about this question when we talked about it uh, on our group chat. So he says, um, let's see here. He says, first of all, I'm now a listener to pretty much all the podcasts. I think big uh, media, bodybuilding media channel, and really appreciate all of your content there. He says, uh, second, he says, I'm coaching myself now for years, and I'm coming out of season right now. Did the Arnold Classic UK and uh, want to do the Arnold in Ohio in March. So there will be technically 12 weeks off season in between, and I never had that situation before. Um, usually I always took one year in between shows. So maybe I need an opinion or a second point of view about the next 12 weeks, um, what I am thinking about. Um, what would... Uh, would you mind if I ask? Let's just drop it there. We'll cut. We'll cut it at that. That's where I'll stop. Did reading. he say where he placed? Oh um, no, he didn't. I mean, to me, if he got first or second, then yeah, okay, go ahead and do it. But if you got like seventh or tenth or worse, then well, you obviously need to make. Well, is he asking before. to do it though, or is he asking how to transition between those twelve weeks, like how to handle diet and training? I thought he was asking about how to deal with that time because the shows aren't very close together not so far apart that you would go total off season and then come back to prep so i think he's asking about how to hold condition or do i let it go a little bit do i keep it yeah am i wrong okay well, I, well, no. I read this as a should he do it or should he take the time off yeah he was just trying to figure out how to how to manage this 12 weeks because normally he takes a year off so skip yeah. what where would you go with this man <sighs> 12 weeks sucks. That's where I would go right away. Um, because it's no man's long. Land. Yeah. yeah, it's rough. It And psychologically, I'm just giving him a heads up. It, it, it beats people up. Usually you're going to get into about five, six weeks halfway through and you're going to be like, oh, fuck me. I would want to keep him very, very tight. I don't want it to slip very much. The problem is, is you have to let it go a little bit, it, not let it go from a condition standpoint, but you have to get calories up as, as much as you can without starting to really pull away from condition. You got to keep them full. I would cut back on a little bit on training at first, make sure recovery is good, take the cardio down a little bit, try to decrease activity to make sure recovery is really, really good to be able to maybe amp up for like the last eight weeks. But when I say from a condition standpoint, I don't think you should lose much. I think you should go full. You can take your weight up a little bit, but then you need to be really just jumping back in if you let it go too much you're gonna then you're gonna be pushing the you know racing the 11th hour and you don't want to do that you you just, and you don't want to keep it super super fucking tight and drive them into the ground have metabolic issues and you know and recovery issues and shit like that either it's a difficult i'm not telling him not to do it all i'm saying is expect it to be very very difficult psychologically and then the close second will be physically I feel like he I worded that stand. wrong though, because I'm pretty sure it's more than 12 weeks from the Arnold UK to the Arnold. Ohio, yeah, that's what that is. It yeah. or maybe 12 weeks before he starts his next prep. Yeah, I think that's what he sort of meant. But um, oh, maybe he's got 12 weeks of off season prior yeah. to the start of the prep. I think he has more time. Oh, than that. okay. That might be. Then well, maybe when, that's what he's. Thinking. Yeah, because if it's the Arnold just happened, that's UK. September, October. 
Then it's in March. November. Yeah, so that's like six months. Yeah, I'll bet it's 12 weeks so, I see. before he would start his prep. That's a different... That's a, I still wouldn't let the condition go very much because you're going to yeah. go getting into your off season. You're not going to be able to do much. Right do it again. You're not going to no. be able to do would, much at all. I would still try to exploit some growth though and like do like a push pull. So you know what I mean, like push really hard, but then pull back to keep conditioning in check and mm -hmm. try to get some progress. You know what I mean? I think that's a good time. You could definitely get most out of your rebound. Just don't let them get too sloppy. You know, like stay within like 12 percent body fat or whatever. Um, it also depends on how well he diets. Does he get in shape easily? Does he, you know what I mean? Is he stubborn fat loss? So like for myself, like, I feel like I could pull that off, you know what I mean? With like six months, yeah. you know, push really hard with food, keep conditioning in check, um, you know, try to make some good progress. Cause why am I going to go to the show and look the same? I mean, you know, right. Yeah. Well, that brings me back to the, why I was asking, like, did he place first or second or did he place like outside of the top five? Because if he placed yeah. outside of the top five, Unless you were just out of shape and you missed your mark and you really think you can dial it in this time, which it's going to be harder, by the way. Um, yeah. I just don't think it makes sense to do this show, the, the Arnold Classic. That's just my take on it. But I guess we'd have to know a little bit more information, you know? like You make a good point, out. though, because if he's not battling for the top spot, then why not just put it off another year to That's really move up in the rankings? And if he is right there at the top, then I guess I could understand that. Yeah, yeah I mean, if he won his class but didn't get his pro card – and you know he was the middleweight or something like that and he's you know he thinks he he can he can dial it in this time even more or maybe move up to the light heavies and have a, a better shot at because don't they give away uh, three pro cards i think at the arnold for the amateur or is it one i can't remember yeah. i think, it's, I think it's, know, it's one i thought it was one but i could be wrong honestly i wouldn't do that show <laughs> personally like i think you should probably yeah. look at it Especially you know what though a lighter weight class guy if what if he's a weight class guy that makes no sense to do this show? What if his goal isn't to necessarily turn pro? What if his goal is like, so if he's in the UK, he wants to come and see the Arnold, be there, be a part of, because I, you know, Mike Davies runs the Arnold Amateur and the last couple of years, it's been cool getting to go backstage and hang out that whole day and watch all these people. Literally, there's like teams from the Middle East and teams from yeah. Uh, you know, Italy and all that. And then he has like uh, he, just such a cool setup. Like the whole show is such an experience. Translators for all these different countries. And maybe he just wants to go and experience that, you know. And yeah, in that case, you it's, think that a, it's like a vacation prep. It should be an experience show. Yeah, if you're good enough, man. And then, you know, that you can well, hang. That's what I'm asking. Is, is he good enough? If, is, if is you're he, good enough you know, to hang, is he on you know. The level? Yeah. If like maybe he gets 16th or DNP yeah. or whatever. And he just wants to go to do the Arnold for the experience. I would say go to the Arnold for the experience as a fan. You know what I mean? Like, I just think if you're not like competitive, uh, it's almost a disgrace to the stage to try to get on a pro qualifier stage. Like, if, well, if not, I don't know, man. I feel like, you know, maybe maybe you're good. Maybe you maybe you're top ten. Okay, what like what's what's probably. good enough? Like, I guess what you're saying is because what say, you I would agree with you, top ten. Yeah, if top you're 10. top ten and it's like, hey, maybe I can move up from ninth place to seventh place or whatever. You know, it's like maybe I'm not going because I am going to win, but maybe I can do better than I did last time. And you know, I just was thinking that it's not necessarily about the pro card for some people in that situation was all. Well, let me ask this question. I, but I, I agree I with you that. about being competitive. If you have to pick one, is the UK Arnold more competitive or less competitive than the Ohio Arnold amateur? So I've seen the Arnold in Ohio vary, like in like like this one year to the next. You know yeah. what I mean? Like right. the heavyweight class this year was pretty freaking good, right? Was it the heavies? Mm -hmm. Renee, did you watch the heavies? Uh, I think you're talking about the Olympia amateur. They didn't have the Arnold amateur this year. Uh, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the Olympia. The Olympia amateur heavies were pretty good yeah, this that was year. Good. There were some good like, people at that show. Yeah. There's some good talent across the board, actually. Whereas well, like, yeah, there's but... other years, you're like, there's one guy that looks like he's like a really good bodybuilder. Then there's like four guys that looks like they're five weeks out. And you're like, what the hell? So well, yeah, the Ar I... Arnold amateur used to be crazy like three or four years ago when like that kid, Nico or whatever. Uh, I don't uh, know, remember, like, there's a lot of good that turn pro there before like all the yeah. regional pro qualifiers happen yeah yeah there, that's why i ask happened? because i think that the arnold the by and large qualifier. years after like year after year if you kind of average them out i think that the arnold here would probably be tougher and and i hope that nobody from the uk gets pissed at me because that's not what i'm saying but but i would assume that the american Arnold would would be tougher than the UK. So if he did well there, is he coming here for the experience? Is he coming here to 
get a pro card. And if it's harder here mm. than it was there, then why not take more time and potentially go back to the UK Arnold? Now, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm not telling him what to do. I'm not telling him he's not good enough. I'm not telling him he sucks. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just thinking out loud if maybe he maybe again i'm assuming but maybe he's in a rush to get a pro card maybe he's just like you know what i want to run back i'm not going to wait until next year there's a lot of what ifs i don't know it'd be good to know what his motivation is for wanting to do the show and how close he is if he's a contender or if he is doing it for the experience or he just wants to get you know taken i'll give you a real world example i'll give you a real world example Nate got uh, second place in the 2019 North Americans. So it was a no-brainer to go and do the Nationals that year, which was only, yeah. what, 15 weeks, 14 weeks later or something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And again, he replicated and, and finished one spot away from Pro Card again. Same thing happened, you know, last year when he got third place in North Americans. It's a no-brainer. Go to North, go to Nationals and let's, let's see if we can get the job done there. You know what I mean? Whereas if he was placing like six, seven – my advice would have said, well, let's go back. Let's come back to North Americans next year. Let's skip the nationals. Let's, let's give it a good year. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I guess yeah. it, we just need more information as to what, what his mindset is and what his goal is and, and, and all that. You know? but I, I, my I, thought I, is God. it's, it's a long way to travel yeah, for what, for point. one pro card though. I, I think he yeah. wants to probably enjoy the experience of the Arnold as well, because now there's so many of these pro qualifiers in every country so if he really was chasing a pro card, he probably would have just done like another show that's in like Portugal or something like that. Yeah, that's a pro good, qualifier yeah, like good four point. weeks later or something instead of doing like, you know, waiting oh. six months to do the Arnold Classic Ohio. Yeah. He's in the well, then I still go back to him. Like, why not just go as a fan? Yeah. Because like, right. like when's he going to improve, I guess? When's, when's yeah. he going to improve? If he, if he loves bodybuilding, like when is he going to improve right. is, is my point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I could get it if he was – hunting for the pro card he was like right there in his class and he wants to take another shot at it you know five months later i totally understand that and he's got the discipline and mindset to stay in shape and and all that but i guess if he still has a lot of improvements to make why not just go to the arnold classic as a fan enjoy yourself have a few free meals and stuff with friends and stuff and um right you know and continue bodybuilding to to you know maybe come back to one of the shows more local to him next year to try to compete for pro card Mm -hmm. that's just my thing All right, guys. Well, let's wrap this thing up here. Uh, we got a bunch of good stuff. We had some more. We weren't able to get to everything. Um, I would have loved to have heard more about your guys' experience at the Olympia. Uh, it sounds like. Yeah, you guys met in person. Yeah. <laughs> All right. pictures. Usually it takes 14, 16 years before I meet people. So it's kind of nice yeah. to meet Andrew and Rachel, too. Um, right. and I, so I, I met was, Mr. Was, Skip. Yeah, it was it was it and a was couple cool. of his clients. Yeah. He, he was VIP. He was sitting at the table. He had like all these people surrounding him, getting him drinks and stuff. <laughs> I had to wait Security in line. Detail. I had to, I had to yeah. wait in line. And then, you know, I, I brought up the courage to ask him for a picture. And um, he, he did. Uh, he did give in. I, I have, looked up at him at first. I didn't recognize him. I'm like, who do I make this out to? And now, oh, <laughs> oh. Andrew, was uh, uh, was Andrew as tall? as uh as he appears uh on video and was skip as dark as he appears on video (laughs) it was darker it was darker than he appeared because there was super dim lighting in the whole place anyway but uh but no no uh, i i was very impressed with his tan very impressed right on and as we recently discovered nate spear got his instagram back but you can still go follow him at the original uh at nate spear of course and go over to uh body berry Dot com. You can get a hold of Andrew over there. You can go to teamskip.com to harass Skip and uh, follow these guys on Instagram. You can see Skip's. You, do you put your cat videos up still ever in cat I do pictures? On Instagram. Yeah, okay. I got a picture here. You can see the cat get, tree behind me. I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. New cat tree. Yeah. New cat tree. Yeah. New cat tree. Yeah. I saw, I saw a bobcat this morning, Skip. A bobcat? What? A oh, no bobcat. shit. For real? Did you I catch it? my dog. For no, the thing just stopped and stared at me for a second. I'm like, man, yep. that's a big cat. I'm like, oh, shit, that's a bobcat. Holy and I shit. I tried to whip out my phone real quick, but the thing darted and took, uh, uh, went away. Yeah, uh, it, it was a good-looking shit. cat. Good-looking yep. cat. They're, they're more uh, scared than anything. They're, they're, they're so few and far in between. They don't travel in packs or anything. You got to catch yeah. that and send it to Skip. Just let it loose in his apartment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So listen, I appreciate you guys hanging out, and uh, I appreciate everybody who's hanging out on the live feed with us uh, for another episode here at Think Big, Blood, Sweat, and Gear with Skip Hill, Andrew Barry, Nasty Nate Spear. I'm Scott McNally. We'll see you guys soon. Mm-hmm.